Wait, there's a second episode now? Ah, jeez, I thought we were just doing the one. Well, there's no time like the last possible moment, so let's get started. In the interest of my sweet little darling innocent show onlys, I won't be mentioning any plot points from the book that have not yet occurred in the show. However, Snape does kill Dumbledore, it's the sled, and Goku wins. Mmm, here we go, I hope it's good. We open on a brand new intro sequence, which may also be spankin'. I quite like the new visuals, it's an interesting way to reimagine the whole diorama idea and they've clearly put at least an equivalent amount of effort into it. Game of Thrones was huge in terms of spatial scope, so zooming around a map made lots of sense. The same isn't true here. The incest family variety hour has more of a grand temporal scale, so they instead start each show with a trip through time with the Targaryen family tree. Or, as it so happens, family telephone pole. Surely they'll update it as the show goes on to match what happens to the family in this story. Spo Spoilers, things happen to the House of Dragons. That's what the show's about. This initial episode of House of Dragons. It's called House of the Dragon, Benjamin. I'm worried a lot of the meaning here would be lost on people who aren't desperate nerds about this whole thing, with each node having a symbol representing a specific person in the family's history, but I guess it doesn't matter too much. It sounds great too, with a fantastic theme song. I'd love to make a video someday about why it's so fantastic, but unfortunately I've already heard this tune, because I have seen Game of Thrones. Have you seen Game of Thrones? Of course, the title song is iconic, and you can understand why they'd reuse it, but ultimately I'm disappointed. There's some wonderful original music in the show so far, and Maestro Giovanni is clearly capable of catching lightning in a bottle again, so it's a shame that we're relying so heavily on the old theme. The screen no longer fades to black at the song's climax, so it just lingers on the title card while the last few bars play. It worked perfectly in Game of Thrones because it was bespoke. <laughs> Here it's just weird and feels kind of out of place. You could have used the same motif and just rejected it a bit, fucked with the tempo, the instrumentation, the key, layered it with some of the other main themes of the soundtrack. Instead it's literally the exact same track they use for Game of Thrones. Again, I get why they did it, and I'm sure they tried other things, but I haven't heard anyone express enthusiasm about this decision. I gotta sing something, and they still haven't given me original theme to farm views by analyzing, so I guess I'll just keep going with the 80s rock belters. Any way you want it, that's the way you need it. Any way you want it. Very strong open on Kragas feeding his pet crabs. That's fucking sick. It's one thing to call your villain crab feeder, and another thing altogether to show us the horrors of his practices. That they went all out with this is a very good sign. They could have just not done this, but they did. And as anyone who's ever filmed on a beach can tell you, there are very big reasons to not. Anyway, we cut to a boring scene of boring people talking boringly. Ryan Redwine is dead, fucking rip, and the new Lord Commander is Harold Westerling, the Silver Fox. Parenthetically, how sick is the Kingsguard armor though? We have to find a seventh sword for the White Cloaks. Choose your fighter! Collis storms in to chastise the council about not doing anything about the stepstones. Silly Collis, nothing is what councils do. In my last video I expressed a smidge of concern about the Valarian family's presence in King's Landing, but I completely get it now, and in fact I commend whoever made that decision, but we'll talk about that later. Otto says they'll pay him for his lost ship and men, but I don't um, want compensation. Okay, this delivery is sick. He didn't get much spotlight in the pilot, so the gravitas Collis has in this scene is a welcome sign. The main plot of the episode has him and Otto in a political dick swinging competition and we already know a bit about Otto so starting it by showcasing Coley's strength and power through his delivery is a good call. Viserys obviously isn't too interested in doing a war and Lord Beesbury explains the historical precedent for staying out of the free city's concerns. Coley's replies by pointing out how weak Viserys' regime looks, naturally integrating the exposition that half a year has passed and Daemon now holds Dragonstone with his personal personal army of gold cloaks. The six months figure is thrown around a few times in this episode. Damon has squatted there for over half a year. It's only been half a year since my mother died. It hasn't even been half a year since Emma passed. But calling it a problem with the script would be silly, so why would I even mention it in my video? A seat at the king's table does not make you his equal. Here's a little known fun fact. Every C3 
scene featuring Otto Hightower suffered from skyrocketing budgets because Reese Evans just can't stop eating the goddamn scenery. Vissera says, nah, uh, uh, I did do something about the pirate incursions in our most vital shipping lanes. See? I sent letters. So, yeah. Rhaenyra butts in, huge, suggesting she and Rhaenys should just mount their dragons and kind of just fuck everything up. Girl boss, Viserys gatekeeps, and Otto gaslights. Corlys is hella into it though. Hella. Ha! Serves you right for trying to make a point while not possessing a wang. Dude, what's the point of having your heir in the council chamber if you're just gonna send them away the moment they say something you don't like? Viserys doesn't know how to educate Rhaenyra to rule because all he knows is placation. Um, making Harold Rhaenyra's sworn protector is just a cute little detail they rolled into the story, and now that he's Lord Commander, they have to fill his role. Makes sense. Yo, the sigil markers, that's sick. I love this world's obsession with miniatures. And look at their helmets and their surcoats. Oh, it feels good to be back in a Westeros that takes itself seriously. Ooh, Rhaenys is watching for some reason. Fair enough, she's probably bored shitless. Only so many times you can rewatch the Golden Girls. Otto coaches Rhaenyra on how to look like you care about someone, so that's neat of him. At first I was super confused that the Silver Eagle of House Malister was flown on a blue field because I've only ever seen it on purple. Turns out the wording in the books is indigo, and of course indigo means literally any colour. In any case, Ryman Malister doesn't impress the princess and she asks for some Someone who knows how to kill. Ooh, Kristen, the hot one. Even his little marker looks like. Ah, I'll let that joke write itself. It's plain to see how warmly Rhaenyra receives Kristen in contrast to all the less sexy, less experienced knights who are of higher political standing. She doesn't care about placating other houses, keeping them in the crown's good graces by extending gestures like this. She cares about sexy knights who can kill people and eating cake on dragonback or something. Simply put, Otto speaks politically. Houses such as Crickle or- and Malister are important allies of the crown. While Rhaenyra speaks in material terms. My father should be defended by a man who's no real combat. While Otto has little trouble pushing his will on her father, Rhaenyra herself is more headstrong. I choose Sir Kristen Cole. Okay, it is Valyria. I previously assumed Viserys knew what Valyria looked like because of his connection with Valerian or from his dreams. But here he mentions poring over the histories. So it's a little thing and there's nothing wrong with what they wrote. But I don't know, I think I'd have preferred one of those other things. Anyway, it looks great and it's adorable how Alicent just smiles and softly encourages his very sane obsession. Not that I'm really one to talk when it comes to hyperfixations. I'm excited to see how this model will play a role in future plot points. You know, what events might occur in, on, or around this symbol of the source of Targaryen power. Speaking of symbols of the source of Targaryen power, Viserys drops his little dragon figurine which he hadn't gotten around to painting yet. Oh gee, I hope this isn't indicative of something. Surely not. This is just a wholesome story about about a man who loves his little models and his struggle to decide which child to marry. While it is cute to hear him speak of the lost empire, Valyria was a horrific institution. He only views it so positively because he and his family would have been the beneficiaries of its atrocities. This conversation is an effective way of demonstrating how his relationship with Alicent has grown, by the way. Like it's clear from the get-go that they've been getting used to each other over these six months. Alicent isn't fidgeting anywhere near as violently and her voice is much more comfortable. There are times when I would I'd rather face the Black Dread himself than mine own daughter of 15. Oh, he's scared shitless of his teenage daughter. I want to hug him and his big, stupid, ineffective face. At the end of the scene, we learn that these weird fucking dates have been kept secret from Rhaenyra. Wait, don't tell my daughter that we look at my scale model of the ancient empire together. She wouldn't understand. Cut to a big old sept. As soon as we find out that Alicent has a big secret she has to keep from her best friend, we have a scene between the two of them that begins with Rhaenyra talking about how her dad's counsellors scheme to marry him off. The plot is so focused. Every shot is so beautiful, oh my god. Alicent asks Rhaenyra to pray to the mother with her because, you know, both of their mothers are dead, and as Emma said last episode, motherhood is likely to play a big role in Rhaenyra's future. Rhaenyra doesn't know how to process the grief of losing her mum because her dad sure as hell isn't helping, so even the mere suggestion of just thinking about it sends her into doing some cries. She wants to be seen as more than just a little girl, in line with what we saw earlier and what she just said about being replaced as heir, and Alicent uses this to push her towards Viserys. Honestly, the impression I get from these scenes is that she's genuinely invested in repairing their relationship, perhaps in fear that they'll become as distant as herself and her own father. They still are best friends, and nothing will ever come between them.
ever. The end of this scene is punctuated with that theme I gushed about last time, this time adapted for just high strings, for kind of a haunting effect. Viserys meets with the Valarians in the gardens. My niece is my favourite cousin after all. Dude, she's your only cousin now that your wife's dead. Unless you want to count Sarah's bastards. Stiff competition, Rhaenys. One of them has an elephant, but you made it out in first place. Congrats. Call this extends an olive branch, reasoning that maybe yelling at the most powerful person in the world isn't the best way to accomplish his goals. But he's still realistic, describing in material terms the issues he and the realm face. A girl has been named heir to the Iron Throne, the first in its history. Didn't Arya go through enough, Corlys? Why you gotta do this to her? She was the heir and nothing went wrong. Everything was great. Ooh, a sailing metaphor. To elude a storm, you can either sail into it or around it. So Viserys asks how exactly Corlys intends on dealing with these issues, namely the Stepstones, and the Sea Snake's response is Join our families. If I were picking nits like the sociable chimpanzee I am, I would point out that the families are already pretty joint and they can go deal with crab feeder without having to do this, but I get that they're using this opportunity to strengthen themselves in their political position and do away with the enmity between their branches of the family. And oh yeah, put their grandson on the throne, I guess. I just think it's a little stilted that his response to how do we deal with my cranky brother and the weird pirate dude is I know you should marry our preteen daughter. Much of this episode is about how power is a volatile thing you have to fight for. I knew what I wanted. So I went out and seized it. And following Corliss, we see the different avenues he takes to get what he wants. It's dinner time. Boy, I hope those crickets don't feel awkward. They both loved Emma. Oh, but they don't know how to talk about it. So instead they resort to it's not exactly small talk, but it definitely isn't big talk. Rhaenyra brings up the thing at the council, thinking that she could, you know, maybe explain her idea in more depth. Ha <laughs> Oh, don't worry about that. It's not your fault you didn't know not to say that. Oh, but I just wanted to point out that- Yes, I know you were wrong to do that. No need to apologize. What a beautiful father-daughter bonding moment. An even more beautiful moment follows. Viserys' wound isn't healing, so Melos has these Wrigley boys have a go at it. Power has caused caused his flesh to rot, so I guess in this metaphor the maggots are like the proletariat? Why not? He tells Otto about his lovely meeting with the Valarianses and he's like, no, you can't just do that, that's cheating! You have to get your daughter to subtly seduce the king, you can't just ask, no! But yeah, this basically kicks Otto into go mode. That is what I'm doing, presently. If anyone watching happens to be in the council of Zoomers that decides which memes are funny, I beseech thee to ensure this becomes a standard in the reaction gif canon. Trust me, it's got great application. So Melos is like, yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. Good match. Go, go for it, King. You dropped this. And you might be wondering how that works with the whole obviously in cahoots with Otto thing. Well, if he enthusiastically rejected the idea, then it would become more obvious to Viserys what's actually going on here. Keep in mind, Viserys isn't stupid. He's just... An idiot. Furthermore, it's clear that Viserys already has his own reservations about marrying Lena, so maybe Melos is just trying to lead him to those reservations himself. Or we're wrong and there's no spooky alliance between the High Towers and the Maces, but that couldn't be right. Condor would never hurt Preston's feelings like that. Otto makes a sympathetic argument. Oh no, I would never want to replace my wife for duty's sake and maybe you shouldn't either, but oh gee, maybe subtextually if there was someone I actually kinda liked I might marry them? Who who knows though? Anyway, Lena's 12. Ah, it can't be that bad, right? Oh, um, this character is a child. Pass. After establishing that Viserys indeed does not have games on his phone, he and Lena speak of Beleriand and of Valyria. Do you know where Vega is now? On the second most fucked up date I've ever seen, little Lena asks the king where his biggest nuke is. Vagar's whereabouts are a mystery, which is sort of like losing track of a bunch of actual nuclear weapons. But that would never happen, right? Right? At least they tell us that she's too big for the dragon bit, explaining how she's just gone. Lena says workers at Spice Town on Driftmark hear Vagar singing. All in all, it seems like this little girl is just a bit too fixated on the whereabouts of the biggest weapon in the world. After all, as I said earlier, this episode is about how power must be seized. So you go, Lena. You go. Acquire that nuke. I imagine even dragons get lonely. Aww, Viserys. Lots of people have said lots of things about the wigs in this show so far. I think they're fine for the most part, but Lena Valarian's is not fine. Like, I can see her roots. That's, I don't think that's good. That I wouldn't have to bed you until I turn 14. 
Oh, that makes it fine then. Rhaenyra was watching her dad's date. Leave him alone, he's going through some stuff. Now, you may have noticed that Rhaenyra's story is concerned with expectations of women in terms of succession and in terms of power, more broadly speaking. So we're treated to this conversation about such things with the most suitable person for the task, Rhaenys, who of course received the ultimate shunning from the system on the sole account of her gender. Additionally, Rhaenys is fucking cool and I love her dress, but I don't think it'd fit me. Like Emma, Rhaenys expresses resignation to the way of the world. Because that is the order of things. Understandable, considering. But Rhaenyra seems galvanised against it. When I'm queen, I will create a new order. The pursuit of a male heir did kill her mother, after all. If you mean to elicit some anger from me, you should know that you're failing, princess. I'm not mad, you're mad! And when that boy comes of age and your father has passed, the men of the realm will expect him to be heir. Spoilers, Rhaenys, come on! She does speak truth about penises being required to govern. Do you remind your father's men of that as you carry their cups? Dude, get wrecked, Nero, take the L. Men would sooner put the realm to the torch than see a woman ascend the Iron Throne. Oh no, it's becoming woke nonsense! Somebody do something! Viserys talks marriage with Alicent. Okay, so earlier I talked about how she's more comfortable with him now, but here, now that they're talking about marriage, there's a very obvious shot where she's fucking with her hands again. So this particular subject makes her anxious. Is it because she doesn't actually want to be in this position, having been forced here by her father? Or is it because she's worried her efforts may have been in vain if he ends up marrying Lena? Probably the former. Either way, she's had his broken dragon and model mended and he absolutely froths that. Jeez, maybe this symbolizes Alicent's role in repairing whatever the hell the dragon might represent in the eyes of Viserys. Mm. Come. Otto summons Viserys to an emergency council meeting, leaving Alicent there to just play with the dragon. Yeah. The dragon keepers apparently speak only Valyrian? You'd think if this guy spoke normal, he would hear, so everyone in the room could understand him. You think this guy understands Valyrian? His name is Harold, for fuck's sake. He doesn't understand anything. Oh right, the plot. Yeah, Matt Smith in a wig has stolen a dragon egg, which from context clues I'm picking up was something he wasn't supposed to do. Otto and Melos produce a massive from the prince. Uh, sorry, a missive, announcing he's going to do a polygamy. All about love and marriage this episode, isn't it? The prince has invited you to his wedding, your grace. Ooh, power move. Absolutely shitting over everything the king wants and then inviting him to watch it happen. That's so Damon. He wants what he wants, but he also wants his brother's love. Who is Lady Missaria? We believe- Damon's whore. Otto, my man. Nothing, go on with your day. Rhaenyra is concerned about which egg exactly Daemon took. Being the one that was once set aside for Viserys' potential heir, this could be a sort of token of legitimacy. Moreover, it's a straight up piss on Viserys and Emma and Balon and Rhaenyra and sometimes when you start a sentence you just can't stop. Viserys wants to go settle shit, but Otto doesn't want him in that kind of danger so he's gonna go instead. I know he'll have soldiers, but what the fuck does Otto think he's gonna do? Daemon is an expert at getting a rise out of him, and we've already seen in just one episode that it takes a lot of effort for Otto to even work around him. He asks his daughter about her self-destructive behaviour impacting her beauty, which is of course the only important thing about her. Why do you destroy yourself? Why do you think, you asshole? He tells her to visit Viserys that night, knowing that the whole marriage thing is coming to a head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Though she doesn't seem too keen on the prospect. Like Emma was, Alicent is submissive to the system that robs her of any agency to the point of self-destruction. Before you can accuse me of being a white knight, Kristen, who literally is one, comes in. I've assembled 20 of your best household guards, my lord Hand. 20? Damon has an army, you spoink! And a dragon! And a wig. Does Otto want to fail? I guess keeping Damon and Viserys estranged is good for him, but on the other hand, he surely doesn't want the king's brother in some kind of open rebellion. Or you could say, a prince who's gone rogue? What would you call that? Ah. We arrive on Dragonstone. Fuck yes. It's every bit as imposing as it should be. This is the same bridge from season 7, by the way, but Jesus Christ, every shot is so fucking awesome. Look at that sun! Hey, Otto, the helmet's not much use in your hand, is it? Why did you bring the Grand Maester with you? Damon shows up, egg in hand, along with Missaria and some gold cloaks. I just love this crazy kid's antics. It's a Crispin, wasn't it? Damon fucks up Kristen's name, and so hereafter in the series, I must also fuck up the name of Sir Christmas Cole. Anyway, Crispo demolishes the prince. Perhaps my prince recalls when I knocked him off his horse. <laughs> 
Very good. With every line, Matt Smith further convinces me that this was an excellent casting choice. His acting as though absolutely nothing is wrong with what he's done is so delicious. Like, everyone here knows he's a little shitter, but it simply doesn't matter. I like how you can see, even this early, that Masaria was not privy to Damon's little ploy here. Lady Masaria is to be my wife. Damon offers Otto the egg, but for some reason he just stands there. Go on, take it, he's giving it to you. He's being nice. Don't be rude. Can I offer you a nice egg in this trying time? To choose violence here is to declare war against your king. Wonderful. <laughs> all the swords all at once, classic. Oh, the spicy noodle monster. I love him. He looks so dumb. His little whoops are so cute. All of you. See the fucking steel. Wow, that's how a dragon do. Honestly, what the fuck did you expect? I now have to work a bit of a dimwit into my understanding of this guy. Uh oh, he's Cyrax rippling through the clouds. That's excellent. Oh my god, Caraxi sounds so cute when he's Caesar. Okay, this is sick. That's an entrance. Oh yeah, um taking power instead of asking for it or waiting for it. That's what's happening here. That's the theme of the episode. I'm an analyst. Take care not to startle Cyrax, my lord. He's rather protective of me. This is a clever little display of power. Not that she really needed to display any more power after that. Rhaenyra just talks it out with Damon. The Valyrian sounds great, by the way. I love that he shows her infinitely more respect than he would ever show Hightower. She sees straight through his bullshit, too. Rhaenyra asks Damon to kill her, but instead of dealing with all that trouble, they just play a friendly game of catch. It looks like he considers killing her, but I think it's more likely he's just thinking about how impressed he is by her, or maybe something a bit more incesty. You never know what's going on in his head. Oh, and Rhaenyra is the sun, by the way. The stove is a neat touch. At least Otto thought to bring that. Missaria asks Damon about all the dumb shit he made up in his scheme to garner attention. Her furiousness is understandable, and a fresh perspective on how the games of the elite impact those around, or more aptly, below them. You are Targaryen. You can afford to play your stupid games with the king, but I cannot. He is outrageously confident that she'll be safe from the consequences of his nonsense. Lots of people seem to mind her accent and... eh? It's fine? I'm not sure what you were expecting. Oh my god, imagine if she just had a straight up valley girl accent. I came to you to be liberated. From what? Fear. Missaria had to fight for power, almost as though that's a fucking theme or what have you. Viserys examines his dragon again, maybe as like a point about the fragility of Targaryen power or something. He talks to Lord Strong alone. Proud men don't like having to look up. This is a great line and also deliciously subtextual because I mean just look, Lionel is an impressive lord in his own right and holds one of the highest stations in the realm and yet here he is having to look up at Viserys. That said, he doesn't seem to have a dog in this particular fight and quite rationally breaks down the situation for the king. He lists everything great about marrying Lena Valerian, including her unimpeachable Valerian stock, and Viserys lists everything not so great about marrying her. She is 12. Let's go, Viserys! It was an extremely low bar, but you jumped well clear of it. I quite like this strong fellow, and he is right. As the most powerful vassal of the Iron Throne, a fabulously wealthy lord, and a legendary naval dude, Corlys is the best possible ally for Viserys. If he doesn't secure an alliance with him, then, well, exactly what happens happens. And he's just kicked the can further down the road, but now it has a dragon attached to it. Yo, it's Stefan Darklin, and he's here to tell our best buds that Rhaenyra is back. Hooray! Wait, Rhaenyra? Nero was gone? Okay, so how the fuck did she leave without Viserys finding out? Someone explain to me how Rhaenyra gets Cyrax and flies her out of the city without anyone telling the king. Surely someone saw a dragon fly out of the pit over the city and across the bay. I don't know, I feel that maybe Viserys finding out about this earlier might give an even better justification for him seeking consolation in the advice of Lionel Strong, given that he now feels completely powerless even over his own daughter. By the way, he talks to all of his counselors about the marriage thing except for Lyman Beesbury. What does he know? He is pissed at Rhaenyra. I like that. You disobeyed me. Deliberately disobeyed me. You deliberately disobeyed me. You deliberately disobeyed me. She sounds so strong in this scene. I think the turning point for Viserys is when he says, You could have been killed. And she's completely unfazed. Like at that point, he finally sees that she's not just a little girl. I struggle to realize that my daughter had so quickly become a woman grown. It takes zero prompting before this guy starts going on about his dead wife. Forget a master of laws, man. Viserys needs a therapist. In fact, everyone in the Red Keep needs therapy. The 
grand therapist. They both understand the other's positions. Their relationship is healed somewhat in this scene, to a point of mutual respect. She says it's okay if he marries someone. He has to. At the council, Viserys comes to terms with his decision to wed. Alicent happens to be there at the council for some reason. Rhaenyra's like, yeah, dad, you go, king, you've got this, and Corlys is ready to claim victory, but nope. The Lady Alicent Hightower. Oh, so you didn't clear the bar that well. Cope and seethe, Valarian. This is an absurdity. I love him. Can we keep him? He clearly understands what's happened here and storms out to go do a plot point somewhere else. Rhaenyra seems a little bothered too. Mm, geez, I wonder what's wrong with her. Like from her point of view, Alicent and Viserys were barely acquaintances and she is not a very good political match. Yes, she's the Hand's daughter, but the Hand is a second son of a house that is powerful, but not Valarian powerful. So um, yeah, maybe their relationship isn't quite so tip top anymore. Look at all the weird shit Corlys has. What a legend. The sea snake gives us a history lesson through a sick ass monologue that outlines the theme of seizing power for oneself. Our worth is not given. It must be made. When he says, Unlike every other lord of the realm, I can say that I built my house's high seat with the strength of mine own back. He's not exaggerating. He built High Tide using the wealth from his own voyages. And so he allies himself with the evil villain, Daemon Targaryen. <laughs> Love it. Through both of these episodes, despite everything, Corlys has never actually spoken against Daemon. So when he says, I've always thought of you and I as having been made from the same cloth. It completely adds up. Early in this video, I mentioned how this episode recontextualized for me why the Valarian family was still in King's Landing in spite of Rhaenys being passed over. They've rolled together a number of unrelated events from the book in what I consider to be an expert move. See, in the book, Corlys was old King Joe's master of ships until Rhaenys was passed over for the airship, the first time when her father died, at which point they left court. But in the show, it seems that the appointment to master of ships was an appeasement of sorts, you know, something to keep Corlys around after we fucked him over. So now that Viserys refuses to do anything about the Stepstones and he's chosen Otto's daughter over his, Corlys' departure from court and jumped the rogue prince feels a lot more dramatic and maybe even more justified. I love this exposition. Game of Thrones was never too into intercutting back and forth between scenes. The only one I can think of is Hodor's Hodoring. But House of the Dragon seems to be a big fan of it and it's a welcome change. Allows for such dramatic... I don't know, it lets what would otherwise just be a conversation also serve as narration and exposition. It was never my brother's strongest trait. What? Being king. Lamau. Damon's like, be careful, cunt, he's still my brother. But yeah, fuck him, let's go to war. Crabfeeder himself has an exciting design. The cobbled together outfit of shit he found floating around is a nice touch, as is the grayscale. Can't wait to see him doing shit the next episode, maybe. Alright, cool, that's the episode. I love eggs, Charlie! And I love crabs. I love crabs. And I love Bro, banging whores. Well. And I don't care if anybody doesn't like that about me. They don't have to stick around. You're right. What's wrong Screw with Screw them. Shit? Yeah, so I think I prefer the pilot, but it's not by much. It's a bit more on the plotty side, which is fine. And I'm happy to see that even with more pieces moving around, there's still time for relationships. There's enough action. So that's exactly what this story needed in its expansion. Uh, Do some likes and comments. Here's me patrons. I'll eat a book. It Excuse me. I'll eat a book if you subscribe. Um, I've been streaming on Twitch if anyone cares. You don't care. Anyway, bye. And do away with the en enmity. En enmity. Enmity. En enmity. Is it really enmity? I guess it is. Enmity. Enmity. It just feels like enmity should be a word. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha.